Um, so just without further ado, I'll, we'll move on to our next speaker. So it gives me great honor to welcome Professor Mary Horgan, um, who has been a familiar face um, on, um, and voice on TV and radio during the past number of months. Um, so um, Mary, I'm gonna hand it over there to you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Karen. I'm going to uh, do the techie part, which is sharing my screen. Um, let's just get this here now. Share. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks. Um, and just to re reiterate what Karen said. Um, it's been a huge learning experience. Uh, I work on the COVID ward in Cork University Hospital alongside my nursing colleagues. Uh, we've had to adapt and learn uh, together and it's been a, a fantastic experience. Um, and what we've learned had made the second wave so much better and easier for us to manage our patients. So I'm uh, going to speak about COVID-19 and the work environment uh, planning for the uh, months ahead. So I'm an optimist by nature. I tend not to, to avoid doom and gloom scenarios, partic uh, particularly on the media. But we're entering this year, which has been a difficult year for all of us with optimism. We now uh, appear to have effective vaccines and more importantly, vaccination programs uh, underway. And I will talk a little bit about that during the talk because it's so important for you as occupational uh, nurses uh, who are key in uh, really keeping us healthy in the work environment. Long lasting immunity seems to be uh, the case. So in other words, if you get infected, it appears that you may be immune from the infection for uh, six to nine months, probably longer, but because the infection is new, we need more information on that, but a uh, really good news story. Uh, rapid testing, you'll have heard um, about that. So the gold standard is PCR testing, which is very sensitive, but tends to be um, more expensive and a bit slower. So what is being looked at at the moment by the HSE is rapid testing. So testing that we can do with a result in 15 to 30 minutes. You'll have heard uh, a rollout of these at a very uh, large case detection level in Liverpool, in, in uh, Slovakia. So that, that is underway. It may help us even more to break uh, the uh, chain of transmission and perhaps use it in, in workplaces, getting students back to university and so on. So I think it's watch this space. Uh, newer treatments certainly have made a huge difference um, for us on the front line, the use of old um, treatments like steroids, uh, preventing uh, DVTs uh, because of the association of uh, severe COVID with uh, thromb uh, thrombosis has really made a big difference in better outcomes during the second wave. I can't reiterate the um, experience of the healthcare worker and how that really has improved the patient outcome, the patient experience in hospital, really was very much uh, everyone from the nurses, healthcare assistants, physiotherapists, pharmacists, uh, doctors really working together in cohorting and supporting um, our patients with COVID. And lastly, we have now the lowest 40 day incidence uh, rate in, in the EU. And this is really a reflection of the huge work the people, the public have done in really adhering um, to the guidelines and really doing the simple things, physical distancing, hand washing, cough etiquette and face masks, all of which have helped us through to where we are now. And hopefully, while I believe there will be more cases after Christmas, I, I think uh, giving the si uh, simple messages and I'll, I'll end up with a slide on what they are. So I'm going to get back to something that's really basic. There are four things that we can do to suppress uh, a infection during a pandemic. And they're the things that we need to remind ourselves all the time. First and foremost, it's human behavior, which I just mentioned. And what's important is communication around that human behavior. It's all up to ourselves. How we behave will influence how the pandemic spreads. And it's avoiding crowds, too many contacts, closed um, environments, uh, and you're all at work to support that in workplaces. But it, that is so important. And the communication should be clear, concise, 
and not confusing because we know so much more about the virus now than we did uh, way back when there was a lot of uncertainty in March and April. So simple messaging um, is really important and it's important that it comes from you who are trusted as healthcare providers. Then there is the second area, which is test, trace and protect. And it's not about just testing what type of tests we use. It's the end to end. And many of you will have been involved in the um, testing strategy within Ireland. So it's everything from identifying who needs to be tested to taking the test, to getting it to the laboratory, whether that's hospital based or, or one of the pro pro uh, private providers getting the results and communicating the result back to the patient and when required back to the um, public health uh, professionals who help contain the infection. So that's a really, really important strategy. It's, it's predominantly PCR based, but as I said, uh, rapid testing may have a role, an additional role, it's not instead of an additional role um, to uh, test, trace and protect. Breaking the chain of transmission is absolutely essential. Then we have treatment and what treatments have we? Well, there are treatments on the development. You all know that the virus causes a big inflammatory response in those uh, particularly who end up in hospital. So it's really important that we have treatments to uh, reduce um, the, uh, that inflammatory response. And they in the community are often non steroidal anti-inflammatories, but in the hospitals, we now pretty much anyone who comes in with low oxygen, we put them on steroids. Um, there are newer anti-inflammatory monoclonal anti-inflammatories that are under development and show some promise. The vast majority of people do not end up in hospital and their symptomatic relief is usually with paracetamol rest um, and once they feel better mobilization. So I think that's the, the, the treatment developments are for the very sickest uh, people. And we've all heard about vaccines and vaccination. And I spend a little bit of time on this because these are the questions you will be asked on the front line. And the patients and the public absolutely see nurses um, on the front line as a, tr a trusted source of information when it comes to vaccines and vaccination, which is the hope. But I think all of these together, vaccines won't be the silver bullet. We will continue to have to do test and trace. We will continue to ha have to modify our behavior in the coming um, months. So vaccines and vaccination. For a vaccine to work, um, it needs a number of things. It needs to be undergo proper trials. And once those trials are through, it needs to go through proper scientific rigor. And within the EU, we have that. It's the um, um, uh, European Medicines Agency. They look at every drug or vaccine or device that comes through to make sure that the safety and efficacy or the effectiveness data that um, companies like Pfizer, like Moderna, like AstraZeneca produce are valid um, so that they can ensure that what's been rolled out is safe and it's effective. So first and foremost, it always has to be about safety and the trials will go no further if there's an issue with safety. After that, they look at efficacy, in other words, the effectiveness of the vaccine. And um, the effectiveness of the vaccine is on two fronts. Um, it's to prevent serious infection, in other words, preventing people who are vulnerable ending up in hospital, and secondly, to prevent transmission. Um, I'll just come back to that because I think that's an important aspect and you will be asked about that. It has to be affordable. Uh, you have to be able to scale it up. And even this morning, I, say, I, I see that by the UK have ordered uh, 40 million um, doses of the Pfizer vaccine, they probably get less than a million before the end of the year. So you, actually, you have to be able to produce it. And then it has to be acceptable to the population. And this is where a lot of the communication, education, listening to what people's concerns are, uh, need to be done so that we can um, move on, you know, get those that are hesitant about taking a vaccine to take the vaccine. So currently, um, the vaccines that are available, they seem to uh, be uh, prevent uh, serious disease. We do not know yet if they prevent transmission. That's why when you hear about who are the priority groups, 
priority groups will be uh, in this section here, uh, preventing those that come into hospital with serious infection and also preventing infection in those who care for them. And that's you and it's me. Um, prevent transmission. We don't know yet if this works, then it will be rolled out to uh, those that we know are vectors for, for transmission. Um, in the most recent wave, uh, it was younger people who tended to get it, uh, even though they didn't get sick, they were sources of transmission. So they would be a target if this area is, um, is, uh, is the case. Just to let you know, um, the two vaccines that seem to be front runners are with the Pfizer and Moderna. It's a totally new technology. And while it's a new technology, the technology has been tried and tested um, for quite some time now. It had been looked, it's been looked at for cancer vaccines. Um, so it isn't as if they just decided to do this a year ago. There's a huge amount of scientific evidence that shows that these work. And essentially, um, it's a little bit of messenger RNA that's synthetically made. It's wrapped in a little bit of lipid, a little bit of fat. It's injected into the muscle. That messenger RNA triggers the cell to make um, a protein. The protein is for the spike protein, which is the part of the protein on the virus that makes the virus uh, get into cells. So this little part of the protein um, triggers antibodies and it's antibodies what protect us. So it's the antibodies made against spike protein that protect us against um, the serious part of the infection. What happens to messenger RNA? It just disintegrates, it goes away. The other, so I'm not going to go into, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions about um, any of the other vaccines. Um, so how do we prepare? And I think this is really important, um, preparing the workforce uh, for vaccination. This is the um, some of the work of the task force led out by uh, Professor Breen McCraw. It's about planning and prioritizing. And if we know the vaccine is, is used to prevent the serious parts of COVID-19, um, then we need to know who are most vulnerable and we know who they are. They're the elderly, um, or older population. Um, if you're over 65, you have a 60 times greater chance of dying from COVID than somebody under 65. We know people with chronic diseases such as chronic heart, lung, kidney diseases, those with diabetes, those with high BMIs. So this is the group, um, the groups that we'll be looking at. We need to communicate um, about the virus. We need to listen to people's concerns and take them on board when we are, um, uh, um, you know, interacting with them. So we're not just telling people what to do. Healthcare settings are really important and healthcare workers will be prioritized um, as well as residents of long-term residential care facilities. And we all know back in March and April, this was a particular area of concern as nearly half the people who died in the first wave were these residents. So they will be prioritized. Vulnerable groups I've just spoken about, and then others, depending on the um, availability of how many vaccine doses. And we do need to tackle vaccine hesitancy, uh, not only with the public, but with healthcare workers uh, who aren't, um, who, you know, sometimes do have concerns about taking vaccines such as influenza. And you all are on the front line, you all give vaccines. So you are actually a really important source of being able to tackle this and feed into why people don't take vaccines. I spoke about uh, COVID-19 and test, test trace isolated. Testing in the uh, workplace is really important. Um, there's work ongoing at the moment within uh, the HSC, looking at how we can prevent nosocomial spread of infections. And Colm Henry and his group are leading out about uh, leading out on this. It uh, came to the forefront, particularly on uh, the second wave in a number of hospitals around the country. So it's really important that we block that uh, chain of transmission. 
There were high risk work, workplaces. Many of you have been involved in processing plans, particularly meat processing. So it is important uh, that we have ongoing uh, uh, testing in those workplaces and high risk accommodation, such as uh, direct provision, uh, people who live very, very close together. Uh, they're often our migrant population. Uh, so again, it's very important that we do targeted testing to support these people uh, in, in where they work and live. PCR testing is the gold standard. The results are from end to end in about 1.5 to two days on average. It is expensive. Uh, so other um, additional tools need to be looked at. I spoke about rapid antigen testing. Um, it's less sensitive, maybe about 70%, uh, but it is rapid, it is cheaper, and maybe a tool to be used in places that is hard to do PCR testing on an ongoing basis. And just to say in the UK, they sent out 25 million a rapid antigen testing to uh, the NHS workforce um, uh, with an expectation that the healthcare worker will do testing twice a week. It's, it's pretty much like a pregnancy test. Um, I know there are men on the, the line, but uh, many of the women will know how quickly these are to do. It does currently require trained professionals uh, to perform in it, but in the UK, they assume that anyone working within the healthcare service could do this and gave uh, uh, instructional vid videos on how to do it. So possible use for rapid antigen testing in the workplace, um, it's used for ca case det detection, high risk workplaces. I've spoken about hospitals, uh, both healthcare workers and uh, patients, long term residential care facilities, meat processing, food processing, uh, university students, high risk accommodation, outbreak setting, and hopefully when we are allowed to get on planes again, uh, maybe a uh, future use of opening up our economy and our ability to live not, not like it was this time last year, but getting back to something that, that is more what we're used to. So the new work environment is very important, and this is really a multi-pronged approach to working and living with the virus. Uh, you've all supported uh, many uh, people, both in private and public um, workplaces, in how to best live at home, because I do think this will be going on for a while. And I think it's allowed us to live differently and work differently. And I just to reiterate, and I've said this, uh, COVID um, has had many unintended consequences, some of which have been good, but some of which have been not so good on the physical and mental health uh, of our population. And I'm very mindful of this. I, like you, see the issues that have been a problem, particularly with mental health on our patients and the people that we support. And we really have to be mindful of this. Um, I, you know, the psychosocial impact of COVID-19, um, impact on mental health, both personal and population. There is not one person who every day does not have a conversation about uh, COVID-19. It can cause anxiety uh, and distress. There's been impacts, and many of which have been negative and cocooning, the isolation component, but also the physical well-being and mo uh, mobility, particularly of our older population. Uh, the pandemic has caused uh, financial pressures, job losses um, on us. We, most of us, will always have a job because we work in the health uh, sector, but many of our, our family and friends, our community will not be in that position. There is um, coronavirus, coronaphobia, the uncertainty and unpredictability, even though we're in a better place now. There's post-traumatic stress disorder from those who suffered it, given the often stigma that we have around it and the fear, will it come back, what will happen? And a coronavirus infodemic, it's overwhelming, it's a constant information and trying to sift through what's real and not. And you are the trusted source of um, valid information on it. So it's about simple messages. They should be clear, they should be repetitive, and they should be tailored to your audience. And really, I think we should be empower, empowering people. I'm always struck by the southeast of the country, uh, for those of you who live there, who, that have constantly have a lower 
fire um, it lower number of cases than the rest of the country. I don't know what they're doing right. Um, and may, perhaps we should learn from them and whether they empowering our local communities to get the message out there in a not finger pointing way, but bringing people along so that we can actually live, open up our economy and uh, continue to open up education, whether it's apprenticeships, uh, universities um, for our young people. And lastly, it's staying safe, safe at work. And I, and I suppose I, I saw this um, tour, you know, in the beginning that we go into work environment in a hospital where I work and people think that the rules don't apply, um, apply there. When we're eating, when we're meeting with our colleagues, it's so important to do the things that are important. Um, keeping two meters apart, wearing a mask if you can't, and getting that constant message out there. Just because you're in a work environment doesn't mean that uh, you don't do the things that we uh, are important to do. And just to acknowledge the huge work that uh, my colleagues in the HSE, particularly in public health, have done to keep us all safe, as well as, as each and every one of us. I think um, that's it, Una. Perfect, Mary, thank you. I'll stop sharing. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mary. That was, as always, um, you know, we're, we're, we're very impressed with um, how positive, you know, we, we all suffer a little bit of uh, COVID fatigue, I think. Uh, it, so I think there's just some questions here that's come through, Mary, um, um, sure. if you wouldn't mind just... Of course. Uh, so, um, should the current antigen testing be used as a mechanism to demonstrate that organisations or, or health and care facilities can open up? Um, I, so, so what's happening at the, at the moment um, is that these tests are under evaluation. There's a lot of tests out there that are pure useless. And currently there's about four to six under evaluation um, under uh, Mary Kilgan, who's uh, leading out on the testing regime. So I would hope that some of them will be approved. They, there's six approved in the UK. And uh, if that's the case, I think they may very well be used as a means of constantly testing particularly our health uh, care work population, where it can be done uh, fairly easily. It, it's, it, it's not, some of it is not as straightforward, or some of the testing kits are not as straightforward as others, but they are rapid results. Um, you will see uh, some information on false positives. Um, if there's a false positive, they just go off into the uh, current testing uh, strategy and would get a PCR to confirm if it's a true positive or false positive. So I think they're an additional tool um, that are current that is currently under evaluation, but I think exciting. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, is, uh, hold on is there any evidence that COVID-19 is mutating? Um, is, uh, is this a factor that might impact on vaccin vaccines? Yeah, yeah, it's a, that is a really good question. So it can mutate for the good and bad, and there's no evidence of it so far. With other infections, we have seen with time when it passages or goes through uh, people, it can get weaker. There's no evidence that that's happening. On the other hand, it potentially could mutate because when I spoke about the spike protein, the, all the vaccines, pretty much all of them that are available are to that. If there's a mutation in that spike protein, it may lead to issues. Saying that, the technology can be rapidly adapted and that spike protein, that piece of gene, genetic material can be also altered very quickly. So we need to keep a close eye on, on it. But so far, no big evidence of mutation, which is really, really good news. Mm -hmm. And I know we're still in the infancy, but another question has come in: that Is there just one vaccine, or do you need a booster at some stage? I know some, you know, some of them obviously are yeah. are, are two doses, but yeah. Yeah, so so the ones that are going coming up front uh, up front, there are two doses. Do we need a booster for, uh, further on? We don't know. Uh, I don't think the testing has been done yet. Okay, um, and just just the last one then on, on vaccinations again, and I know you have addressed it and, and, and the fact that we're going to be forefront in, in um, but how do you respond to the concerns that some members have about the safety of vaccines, whether real or not? And I know you've went through the, yeah. you know, the safety and, and, the and the testing and the clinical trials and that, but do you want to just, uh, that, that's just come back in again? Sure, and again, this is something that really needs to be done at a national level. I think you need to, you know, most people will 
take a vaccine if they get clear communication about it. There'd be a small proportion of people, and we, 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 we've seen how effective they are, anti-vaxxers, um, but what the people you want to bring along are the people who are uncertain about it. Mm -hmm. And the way um, to, 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 I suppose, get the message across is ensuring that everything goes through the regulatory process, that it's all, um, the science is really good, uh, that what happens in Ireland is the same with all our European um, countries because we're under one umbrella. Um, and the importance of following up once vaccines happen, you, ha you have to continue to look to make sure that they continue to be safe. Um, and it's giving that clear message and reminding people the consequences of getting this um, uh, virus, not only on, on us from, from a health point of view, but the huge negative impact it has had on our economy. Mm -hmm. And we do need to remember that. Mm -hmm. And I suppose just leading on to then there, the, what has been seen um, emerging as the long term effects of COVID or, or, or do you know that at this stage? Yeah, and I just gave a talk <laughs> to the uh, GPs on that about long COVID. Look, firstly, to reassure people that most people who get this infection recover completely from it. A minority, as we've seen with some other viral infections, can get what they call long COVID. And I think it's probably different, I won't call it syndromes, but different aspects. I think it's everything from all our immune systems are different. Some people can get an ongoing inflammatory response, most of which can be handled with anti-inflammatories, whether it's not um, NSAIDs or, or uh, steroids. Um, some people are very traumatized by it um, and do need additional support. Some people don't mount as good an antibody response to it and may just be very slow to recover. And then you'll have people who are sicker in hospital who just need more rehab. So I don't think it's just one syndrome. I think it's, it's the number of, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um... Again, sorry, the vaccine is just coming back in again. Okay. Um, so is the COVID vaccine classed as a live vaccine or an attenuated vaccine? Okay, um, it's the ones that are, we have, it's, it's a totally new technology. So um, the ones that are there, it's a, it's a kill, it's only a bit of, pro, uh, of uh, messenger RNA. So it is not a live vaccine. That's the Pfizer and the Moderna. I will say the, um, AstraZeneca is a live vaccine in the sense that they get an innocuous vaccine called adenovirus and they okay. put the, the code into that, that goes in. And then the other ones that are under investigation are all killed vaccines or bits of protein. Okay, very good. So and it's a mixture, there are four different mixture. platforms and it's important to have four different platforms because you don't want all your eggs in one basket and it fails. And will there be different ones recommended then for different groups or vulnerable groups or high risk groups? Or uh, I, I, what, what will happen is the ones that are approved will be prioritised. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter which one it is. Right. And I think with time, the others would, may give us more information about uh, preventing bad disease as opposed to preventing transmissibility. Oh, very good. And both, um, hopefully. Okay. And then um, do you know if the vaccine is safe to be given at all stages of pregnancy? At the moment, there's no uh, data on pregnancy and particularly younger younger children because they certainly younger ch children are much less at risk of either getting it or spreading it. And there is no studies on pregnant women, so it wouldn't be advised until their uh, studies are done. OK, very good. And I'll just see what else. Um, yeah, sorry. And then um, if the uptake is poor, then will the vaccine become mandatory, do you think, for schools or... No, I, I don't I, I never I don't think a, a mandatory approach is, is um, necessarily helpful. I think it's better that we uh, bring people along with us. Uh, we've never done it before and I don't think we should be doing it now. It's our job as healthcare professionals uh, to uh, encourage. Yes, exactly. OK, so and then just back to 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 your presentation there, are you saying children would be classified priority after healthcare workers and vulnerable as they would be seen as vectors? No, um, children tend are, are at least half, children under 10 are at least half as likely to even acquire the infection. Okay. So I would say they'd be lower on the priority list. Um, but uh, and then again, it's, it's defining the current vaccine um, prevents serious disease. So that's where you're targeting it, targeting it. When it comes to transmissibility, we don't know the current vaccines, but they reduce, we'll say, in a young student population, you know, spreading it amongst themselves. We don't know that question yet. 
Okay. I think it's important that those, because I don't think that comes out in a lot of the narrative, that there are two different functions of the vaccine. We'd like both, but mm -hmm. even if we can get the prevention of bad disease, because then our hospital services can be protected. Oh, very good. Um, and so we're going to just wrap up there. Um, and so that's all the, the questions. So Mary, as always, look, thank you very, very much. And we're very honored to have you here today with us and, and, and updating us. So thank you very, very much. Delighted and delighted to be asked. Thank you. Thank you.